We've seen over the years countless times where a team has won the world championship, but when they have to go and defend it, the defense year isn't anywhere near as good. And it could be because the other teams have just genuinely caught up. Somebody's found a cheap hack that helps them sort of overtake the team that was previously the best. It could be just RNG with the reliability or just a straight up fluke. Williams in 1998, Red Bull in 2014, Mercedes in 2022, Ferrari in 2005, all won the Constructors' Championship and or the Drivers' Championship the previous season, and then the following year, they're mere shadows of their former selves. They go from winning multiple races to only one or two, or none, as the case may be. That absolutely mind-boggling thought of that if Indianapolis 2005 had gone as it should have done, Ferrari could have gone the whole season without a win. With Schumacher at the wheel. But what links all those seasons? Rule changes. Between 1997 and 1998, the track got narrower and the groove tyres came in, and then McLaren was the team at the top. Between 2013 and 2014, the hybrids came in, Mercedes was at the top. And between 2004 and 2005, with the tyre rules and the higher front wings, Ferrari dropped off and it was McLaren and Renault at the top. 2021-2022, the switch to ground effect and the start of the Red Bull years. Well, the restart of the Red Bull years. There's a distinct change in car construction that suited one team over another, or allows a reset button to be pushed, or it just jumbles up the order a bit as some teams decide to sacrifice one year for another. But if you're Ferrari in 1980, in terms of the overall regulations, not much changed, and they ended up going from winning the World Championship to... well, their worst season on record. The year before was 1979. Maths. As Lotus had been ahead of the game through 1978 with their ground effect cars, the rest of the teams were now scrambling to build their own, the Garage Easter teams especially, as Ligier were quick to the ground effect party with others developing in the background. Now this did cause a bit of a kerfuffle behind the scenes. There was a bit of a spat between Colin Chapman, aligned with the Foker Alliance, and Ferrari, who were aligned with FISA. Because while Foker was willing to have the teams push the boundaries of what was doable, Ferrari wanted ground effect banned because it interfered with their engine design philosophy. Now Ferrari liked 12 cylinder engines, which were big and got in the way of the Venturi tunnels that were used to suck the car to the ground. And if ground effect was banned, they'd be able to carry on using their flat 12s and all was well in the world. At least, on Ferrari's end. However, Ferrari had still managed to build a ground effect car, because if they wanted to win, they had no choice. Mauro Foglieri had taken the 312 that had been in use for several years by this point and modified it to be able to exploit the ground effect pioneered, at least in F1, by Lotus. While the car used ground effect, it was still heavily reliant on topside aero due to the flat 12 getting in the way. Also, this car was not designed with ground effect in mind. It was first introduced in 1974 and they were still using it with modifications. So it was still having to use the topside error a bit because they were just basically shoehorning this ground effect in. It's not like these days where they take a car, then lob it in the bin at the end of the season and design a whole new one. Even though they might look a little bit the same, they're still completely new cars. And the engine that they were using was the same engine they'd been using in 1970. Okay, yes, the DFE still existed, but they were using engines that were really old, ancient by today's standards. The new 312T4 was introduced for the South African Grand Prix and was immediately competitive. While Renault Jabouille got pole, it was a Ferrari 1-2 for Gilles Villeneuve and Jody Schechter, which was followed up with another 1-2 at Long Beach. Schechter and Villeneuve's fortunes pre- and post-ground effect were noticeable. Both retired in Argentina with both barely scoring points in Brazil, but with the 312T4, things were better. Villeneuve did have races where he was outside of the points, but Schechter was consistently in them and would ultimately win the championship, four points ahead of his lightning-fast Canadian teammate. Reliability was on Schechter's side too, as there is a lot less pink on his row of the results along with Villeneuve's, you know, versus the likes of Alan Jones. Although it's interesting to see here that Jones won more races than both of the Ferraris, 4-3, to three, but he DNF'd too many times to make it count. So it looked like Ferrari had a decent base to then roll into 1980 and still be competitive. Schechter was the champion in 1979, but maybe in 1980 it might be Gilles' turn. Yeah, about that. Basically, the Garage Easters had found the winning formula. The DFV, which was still in use despite coming into service in 1967, well, 1968 if you begin it from when Lotus lost exclusivity, it was much smaller than Ferrari's 3-litre flat 12, which was far too wide to exploit the Venturi effect under the car. While the likes of Lotus, Ligier, Brabham and now Williams had made massive strides forwards, and Renault using turbo engines to keep sizes a bit more compact, if a bit unreliable, if this really was Ferrari not getting with the times, then they were going to be screwed. 
As already mentioned, the car was now six seasons old and hadn't been designed with ground effect in mind. It also produced a lot of drag because it was still using quite a bit of topside aero, while other cars of the era were turning up with front wings that were basically just for show. Lotus, Ligier and company were building brand new cars with ground effect in mind. Ferrari, meanwhile, had gone with a mere simple evolution. Ferrari's least competitive season to this point had been 1969, when Ferrari finished 6th and last of the point scoring teams with only 7 points, in a season where Matra and Jackie Stewart tore the series a new one. The season was peppered with retirements, and a podium at Zandvoort being the only high point of a rubbish season, although some would probably use an adjective a bit fruitier than that. So when they turned up in 1980 at the first round of the season, they were effectively doomed from the start. Their evolutionary car couldn't compete with the brand new models, and while the flat 12 would give them a decent power advantage at anywhere where power was a premium, the all new cars designed by their rivals were far too good in the corners for the 12 cylinder engine to overcome them. It really was shaping up to be a repeat of that awful 1969 season, a season where the Tafosi would be quick to scrub it from the records and their memories if they could do so. Put simply, this car had more floor space than my house. Because the engine was so wide, the car had to be wide, and the Venturi tunnels were made bigger to exploit the ground effect. But because it had all the aerodynamic properties of Yokozuna, the garage Easter teams were only ever going to destroy it. On top of this, the other cars improved and developed, while the Ferrari went nowhere in terms of development. A DFE powered car with 18 inch wide tunnels is going to be narrower than a flat 12 with 18 inch tunnels. This thing was a brick. And actually the better description is to say that it went backwards over the course of the season. Now just as a bit of extra bits and pieces here, it's been quite difficult to get accurate sizing of everything, so whether the car was as big as claimed online needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Part of the arms race in terms of development meant that the tyres were being designed to try and keep up. Ferrari had complained quite loudly about the Michelins they and Renault were using in 1980, and Michelin's development had been tailored more to the Renaults and the turbos they had, with Ferrari stopping for fresh tyres being a common sight throughout 1980. The 1980 car was basically the 1979 car but with only a few modifications. The mini skirts on the side were worse than they had been in 1979 and the glass resin side pods were not stiff enough to cope with the newer improved cornering forces. Because the car couldn't corner as hard the tyres weren't warming up to their optimal and the snowball gets bigger. The worst point came at the Canadian Grand Prix at Montreal. PK had scored pole by around 8 tenths of a second ahead of Jones but down near the bottom in 26th place was Schechter. Under modern Formula 1 rules this would be a qualification, but since only 24 cars could start this race, it's down as a non-qualification. There was no 107% in those days, so as long as you were in the top 24, you were starting, no matter how far off the pace you were. Villeneuve, meanwhile, managed to qualify 22nd and get himself up to 5th as people dropped out of the race. But for the world champion in the Constructors' Championship winning car from the previous season, he wasn't on the grid because he was too slow. That's embarrassing. Villeneuve scored the best results of the season, two fifth places and two sixth places, while Schechter's only finish in the points all year was at the USGP West at Long Beach. From the race in California to the end of the season, Schechter was never close to scoring a point, as it was only the top six scoring in those days. If social media existed back then, he'd be called washed. Eight points in all were scored, which is only one point more than that horrendous 1969 season, and actually, both seasons have a few parallels. I mentioned before about Ferrari being slow to embrace new ideas. There's that famous quote from Enzo where he said, aerodynamics is for people that can't build engines, as he believed that having the biggest engine with the most amount of power was the way to win. Whereas in Britain the mantra was, at least from Chapman, simplify and add lightness, although both approaches had their issues. You know, I'm not going to say that the Lotus approach was better because their cars were notoriously fragile and it was luck that you finished more than anything. Even Jim Clark, someone who was ever so gentle with his mechanical parts, fell victim to this fragility. So when Lotus and the other teams started whacking wings on the cars for downforce, Ferrari was slow on the uptake, because engine power over everything else. By the time 1969 rolled around, the DFV was in the hands of anybody that wanted to buy one, and wings were commonplace. Ferrari had put wings on the 312 in 1969, but they couldn't get them to work like the other teams had. The DFV powered cars were also lighter and handled better thanks to also being shorter because they had four fewer cylinders. Powerful engines were done in racing. It was all about handling. 
Although it should be said at this point that it was also a rebuilding season for Ferrari. Around this time, Enzo had sold 50% of his team to Fiat and was using that money invested by Fiat to help rebuild the team. So it's a little bit more than just aerodynamics bad, I don't want wings, I'm Enzo Ferrari, I'm going to do it my way. Although reading up on some stuff here because the anoraks on the Autosport forums usually have something interesting to say is that the rumour of the time was that Lotus's secrets to success was some sort of trick differential that became something of an obsession for Forgieri. Whether Lotus had intentionally psyched everybody out by having a limited slip diff that could do black magic when really it was just a ground effect, I don't know, but it is something to consider. But one thing to remember as well is that ground effect was still an untapped thing around this time and turbos had been looked at as the future, so the flat 12 design was on borrowed time, as was the fabled DFV. It seems that Ferrari had done just enough through 1979 before the dynamic shift and they were basically in the right place, right time with that particular car and having one that was a bit more reliable. By the time 1980 rolled around the modifications to the car had been a backward step and they had begun development on their own turbo engine at this point. So really it was a mix of resource allocation, bad car and not being able to understand what was wrong with their bad car. There is a story floating around online that they went to about five different wind tunnels and at each of those wind tunnels with the same model of car, they got five different results. Either way, the car was so bad that Schechter just quit racing at the end of the season, or at least quit Formula 1. He only scored two points all year in his title defence season, so yeah, he was gone. While Villeneuve, meanwhile, still had a desire to win, and that's probably why Villeneuve did a lot better throughout the course of the season. He was much hungrier than Schechter was. Ferrari did learn a lesson from this season though. For 1981 they introduced the 126C, a V6 turbo powered car that was borrowing from Renault and really helped usher in the turbo years. Enzo had hired Nicola Materazzi to help build this as Materazzi had been part of the team building the turbocharged Lancia Stratos GR5. The car was an immediate improvement and won two races in the hands of Villeneuve but was still unreliable. With the arrival of Harvey Postlethwaite for 1982, Ferrari was looking certain to take a driver's title, before fate intervened. On top of this, Ferrari had also issued some bits and pieces regarding a 312 ground effect car that took design ideas from the famous Tyrrell 6 wheeler, even going as far as to look at an 8 wheeler, although these were just mock-ups designed to keep the other teams on their toes. Would have been cool if they built a working prototype though. But yeah, 1980, possibly Ferrari's worst ever season. Yes, they scored fewer points, well, one fewer point in 1969, but this was a championship defence season and they got utterly crushed by the competition that had simply taken everything to the next level and left Ferrari behind. So, really, they went from champ to chump. But is it really their worst ever season? I'll leave it down to you to discuss in the comments. So then, a look at Ferrari's utterly atrocious 1980 season. If this has been something you've enjoyed learning about today, then do leave a like on the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, make sure you're subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the fine bunch of lads over at Patreon that continue to support the channel at a more personal level. And if you want to help keep things running around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and bobs that you might want or need to know. Well, there's super thanks and memberships if you want to do stuff that way. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.